I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hey, everybody. Ken Davenport here. You're listening to the Producer's Perspective podcast. Super excited to have yet another superstar Broadway director with us today. This one is so special. From what I hear, he's a citizen of two countries, in fact. Welcome to the American and the Canadian Tony Award winning director, Des Mackinac. Welcome, Des. Thank you so much. So some of Des's credits, Big River, The Who's Tommy, revivals of How to Succeed in Business, which was such a thrill. I love that production. Uh, Guys and Dolls, 700 Sundays with Billy Crystal, and that little teensy weensy hit called Jersey Boys. But the credits go on and on. Go check out his IBDB page if you want to learn more. Um, in addition to all that stuff, Des was the artistic director of the famed La Jolla Playhouse uh, and also the Stratford Shakespeare Festival as well. He's directed opera, a few movies, directed everything except traffic. <laughs> That's my big joke, so we'll just stop there. How did you get started in the biz? Let's go way back to the beginning. Where did it all begin for you? You know, I think uh, I, I more or less backed into the theater, and I certainly backed into directing. Uh, and I think that's common with directors. I, I think it's... Perhaps it's happening now that, you know, young people might set out at, you know, high, in high school to decide to be theater directors, but I think that's probably still quite rare. Um, I grew up mainly, of course, my teenage years uh, happened in the 60s and into the early 70s, and at that time, everyone, uh, every, every guy had to be in a rock and roll band. That was essentially the only way to meet girls. You know, so I played guitar and I started composing music and uh, one thing sort of led to another. Uh, I ended up auditioning for Hair uh, when it came to Toronto, which is where I grew up. And I didn't get into the company. I got fairly far along in the process and actually did a couple of workshops and, and I suppose in a a, a, a most arrogant way, I thought to myself, well, I write songs. You know, I'd done some high school plays. I can do this. So I wrote a musical, and I composed the songs, and I went to a very, very large high school, which was uh, really musical, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of great musicians. And I went to my uh, high school teacher, in the spring and said, I'm going to write this musical over the summer. If I come up with it, will you produce this instead of Maine, which is what they were planning to do as this whole show? And he, he said, sure, you know, I'll, I'll look at it. Not believing for a second that I'd actually do it. So the first day of school in September, I came in with my script and my guitar, and he got the music teacher and a couple of people together, and I, I, you know, auditioned the score for them and gave them the script. And God bless them, they decided to do it. So that's how I really got involved in the theater. There was no decision beyond that. What was the show called, and it, what was it about? It was, it's called, it was called Urbania, and it was about uh, a kind of city of the future. This was at the time of the Vietnam War and so on. And so it was a, about a group of, I suppose, rebels uh, in the, inside the city, underground, rebelling against a kind of totalitarian, you know, regime. So that's that's what it was about. And uh, and uh, I think it had a cast of fifty, and I had a spectacular band. So and I see many of these people to this day. You know, we we get together socially once in a while. If I, if I have a show in Toronto, I invite you know uh, people to that, and so I still see them. And you know, I think for all of us, it was a kind life-changing experience even for those that had nothing to do with the theater beyond that it was a you know it was that moment in high school when I guess a bunch of people come together and do something I guess it's the equivalent of being on a, a you know, championship football team or something like that MTI if you're listening there's an original Des Mackin of musical waiting to be put into a catalog and licensed to high schools all over the country so what was the first directing job that you had well, I, I started as, a, as I say, as a, a composer and a writer, and that went on for a while. And I went through a period in Toronto. Uh, I mean, this is hard to kind of fathom now, but in Toronto, there was a really vibrant theater scene. It was an explosion. 
in the 1970s. And there were a number of reasons for this. Canada was developing its national identity. Uh, there, were, there were grants from the uh, government, the liberal government at that time. Uh, and they managed to seed a lot of arts organizations. So almost overnight in Toronto, there must have been 15 or 20 equity theaters, small theaters mainly. And so it was possible to, you know, actually make a living as a writer. I also worked a little bit for the CBC, for the television uh, network and so on. But I was only about 20 or 21. And I, in fact, intentionally stopped writing music for a while because I felt like I was getting too many opportunities as a composer and not enough as a writer. And I know, again, this sounds uh, uh, far-fetched, but if you had leadership skills of any kind, if you could basically string a couple of sentences together and you were a writer and a, a composer, maybe even a, a, an actor, a, a leading actor, it was almost expected at some point, you know, that you would direct. And so I directed a production of The Black Eye, and I also did an adaptation of Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. And when I arrived in New York at the tender age of 23, I had a resume as a writer, and, and so I immediately got a job here at, at what was then called the Chelsea Theatre Center. And it was only because I was so you know, hideously young compared to other people in the scene. And that had everything to do with Toronto and probably not an awful lot to do with me. We're going to go back into your, your background in a bit, but I want to digress because you talk about Toronto. I actually worked for Livent for three years, so right. uh, I certainly know about the vibrancy of the Toronto market or what it was. It right. obviously has changed a lot. It's just not what it was certainly 10, 20 years ago, never mind right. 30, 40. What do you think happened? Why isn't it the way it used to be? You know, I, I, what the, the not-for-profit scene, the, the, the so-called alternative theater scene, again, exploded at the time uh, that there, you know, there were resources and tremendous resources and an appetite. Uh, I remember a time when you could mention Young Street in a play and get applause in the audience. So I was very young at that point. Uh, and, you know, we passed through that quite quickly. Uh, and then like any art scene, you require young people, students certainly, and, and others that have an appetite for such things. And that went on for a long time. The other explosion that happened in Toronto had much more to do with uh, the commercial theater scene. And that happened really in more in the, in the 80s and 90s. And that was, uh, you know, Garth Drabinsky, who had, was an entrepreneur and saw an opportunity in Toronto to develop shows for New York and London and other places in the world. And, and obviously, I should mention that the Mervishes, to a fellow named Aubrey Dan, was involved for a while. And Toronto's a fairly large market. So that made uh, sense uh, for a while. I'm not sure that it was tremendously lucrative. Uh, so the commercial theater, unfortunately, it, it, it's supposed to be about hopefully creating art, or certainly creating um, quality work, hopefully art. But it also, you know, it's, it's the halls of commerce. So one is required to pay investors back. And although this happens quite rarely, as we both know, there's a goal to actually make money for those investors. And I'm not sure that happened all that successfully in Toronto, even though, uh, you know, there, there were certainly some notable successes. Uh, I think you have to have a lot of passion to produce, you know, a, a theater. And, and I think Toronto continues to be an extraordinary art scene. I, I, I want to say it, it is a fantastic place for the arts. Uh, I think the commercial theater and maybe the alternate the alternate theater have gone back into balance. Uh, I believe Toronto is considered one of the four largest art scenes in the world, along with London, Paris, and New York. Uh, so that in itself is pretty, I think, astonishing. 
Uh, I think at one time the the alternate theater and the commercial theater overshadowed some of the other forums, and I don't know whether they've caught up or the theater's fallen behind. I I like to think that the others have caught up. So let's get back to you. So uh, you arrive in New York at the tender age of 23. You're working at the Chelsea Arts Center. How do you go from that to Broadway? What was the first Broadway gig that you you got? Um, you know, just a step in between. I, I worked at Chelsea at the Chelsea Theater Center, and then be, and then we started Dodgers. So that would have been 1978. So I was still quite young. I would have been 26, and partnered with Michael David, and we've done many many shows together, uh, and we're still. You know, close friends. I actually have an office uh, about you know fifty feet from his uh, to this day, and so I started working for Chelsea, and 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 then went to the Dodgers. And while we were a not-for-profit organization, my partners definitely had um, ambitions in the commercial theater. One of uh, my partners at that time was Rocco Landisman, who ended up being the, the one of the producers, along with Michael, on my first Broadway show, which was Big River. So I met the, uh, those guys the first summer, the first year I was in New York. I think I met Michael David in July. I moved here at the end of May. And so that definitely uh, opened some doors. And then I worked for Joseph Papp. And uh, I worked for, for, for Mr. Papp both as a playwright and as a director and uh, I suppose it was I don't want to say it was inevitable but it was not unusual that I would end up doing a Broadway show and uh, Rocco basically uh, it was his first Broadway show and came to me and said would I like to do this adaptation of Huckleberry Finn and I said well yeah and so we did. So talk a little bit about that how that the Dodgers were formed because I, I find so many artists come to New York and it's a collaborative art form and it sounds like obviously those relationships were a big springboard for you. Rocco going, hey, you want to do this because you were in that organization. How right. did it come about? You know, uh, uh, Michael David uh, doesn't even remember this conversation, but we were working for another organization and I was actually... Uh, the, uh, the dramaturg, as we say here in America, and the dramaturg, as we say in Canada, as well as being a director. I directed for the company and so on. And Michael was uh, the executive director for, for the Chelsea. And basically one night, we he had, I didn't even know he had a car. We were in Brooklyn. We were at the Brooklyn Academy. And we went out for this drive. And he said, what do you think of starting a theater with a couple of our other colleagues and Ed Strong and Sherman Warner. And, you know, again, it was a life-changing moment for me, one that he doesn't even remember. And it just seemed to make sense. We, we, we were all, we called ourselves associate directors. I think he more or less took the role of producer. I more or less took the role of artistic director because I happened to be the one that directed plays. And uh, we started, I think we made $170 a week each when we were working, which was probably about 10 or 12 weeks of the year. And uh, we started producing theater as a group. And again, because I was the one who directed, I, uh, I got, you know, a number of projects and uh, projects that I wanted to develop or that others wanted me to develop. And it was in a very exciting theater. And then as I started going in, starting with Joe Papp, and they started kind of branching off into the commercial theater. And we kept, we've kept this association all these years. When I went to La Jolla, you know, uh, uh, we continued to, to uh, maintain, you know, close ties. And uh, we come together when we have an, artist, an artistic reason to do, to do that, to come together. It's, it's never really been motivated by, you know, you know, necessarily feeling like we have some huge commercial, you know, opportunity. I mean, Tommy is a great example because, you know, uh, I remember somebody one of the from one of the foundations said to me, well, what do you think of, you know, you're doing something that's commercial like that? And I said, wait a minute. I said, you know, we did a, a stage version of a rock and roll album that's 20 years old, more than 20 years old, 
And when we did it, there was no sense that we were going to Broadway, you know. We, we, we were doing it because we, we happened to love this particular piece, and it turned out that it touched a nerve. But if I knew how to do that, to me, I would be in a different kind of business. I would be doing that all the time. If I knew how to say, hey, I know how to create a huge, huge show. So you, you do things that you want to do, and that's what always been the case with my partners, too. Yeah, it's such a great point. Every time I've sat down and thought, oh, I should do this project because it will make money, it usually never does, actually. <laughs> it's you have to do what you love, and then out of that is born something like Tommy, which I was in rehearsals. My first job was the production assistant on My Fair Lady with Richard Chamberlain in 93. I remember. Yeah. We were rehearsed right underneath you. Oh, my God. And I'm ev- sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody was talking about the excitement of upstairs. Okay. I remember you guys got like uh, show jackets, like as a gift uh, as you were leaving to go to Broadway. Something we were all very jealous. <laughs> uh, you've developed a lot of new musicals like that. When do you like to get involved with a show, a new musical? Early in the process, do you like drafts to be done? First of all, I I, I just want to say I do love doing musicals, but I also love doing new plays, and I particularly love doing classical plays. Um, and what's one of the things that took me to Stratford in Canada is that, you know, I love to do Shakespeare. And so I got to, you know, that's a very large company of actors. So musicals, it, it's kind of like part of what I want to see on my dinner play. But I, I think it's always been somewhere around, you know, I don't know 15, 20% of, you know, what I've managed to do, which is about right. I think they all kind of inform each other. The thing I would say about musicals, to answer your question, is I don't think there's a recipe for developing them. Uh, I'm working on a project or sort of cooking up a project with a a writer named Robert Carey. He once came to me with a project uh, called Palm Beach, very good musical, which was more or less complete. Um, It was a complete script, had a score. Uh, I don't think we added a song during the time I worked with him. I did chop it up some in terms of, of moving locations around because we could do that at La, La Jolla and it was in a, a huge Palm Beach mansion and we wanted to kind of go all through the mansion over the course of the play. But other than that, I think that was a directorial contribution. It was his project and, and the composers. It was his play. I'm perfectly happy doing it. If somebody comes along and, sh- and hands me a a musical and it, it's more or less complete. You go, wow, look at this. Where we go, rehearsal, you know, and, and we'll go into auditions. A lot of the time that doesn't happen. And sometimes you do want to get involved. Uh, often you want to get involved as a storyteller. Musicals have to be very efficient, as you know. You've got probably about 45 minutes of, of real storytelling, of real play. And, I mean, everybody says, ah, the musical numbers move the plot along. Well, they do to some extent. A lot of that sleight of hand, they definitely expand the piece emotionally. They take you someplace, uh, you you know, the plays normally can't take you uh, emotionally. There's a heightened sense of of kind of an emotional journey. So you have to be very concise. And it's an advantage sometimes to have the director in on that process early on. I think of people that probably don't create musicals have the illusion, including people that write about them, that somehow somebody goes off to their cabin in the woods and cooks up this script and, you know, on now I guess on the word processor in the old days on the typewriter hammers it up, hands it to the director, the director goes to the designer. And you know, anyone who does this really understands that that's not the case. It's never that neat and tidy. Uh, There's an awful lot of overlap. Uh, It truly is collaborative. And sometimes it's an advantage to have the director in right from the get-go, from the point you're storyboarding or creating outlines. Uh, I've done musicals that have come from so many different directions, from great novels, from rock and roll albums, a how-to book, The Flaming Lips. We did a piece called Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, a wonderful band, a 
a brilliant guy over in Coin, and that show came together from three different rock and roll albums. So they have sometimes they it's a circuitous route that takes you to the musical, and uh, depending on that route, uh, you may find it helpful to be involved as a director. So you've actually directed a number of shows that have come with pre-existing catalogs, if you will, or pre-existing music. Uh, you know, some people might call Jersey Boys one of the most successful jukebox musicals of all time. I actually don't use that word jukebox musical. I think right. it is wrong. I think it's a bio musical, if anything. Good God, I think that's true. Uh, but the music came. Mm -hmm. the, it wasn't like you were going to be like, ah, that one's not good enough, Frankie. Go write something else. Right. Come up with a different song and rewrite the second verse and what right. about a different bridge? Mm -hmm. So you did have stuff to work with. Mm -hmm. How how challenging? How much more challenging is that than working on something new where you can send the writers off to write? You know, for, first of all, on, on that particular project, I did have Marshall Brickman and Rick Al Ellis, uh, you know, writing, uh, and so it was very much a, a, a kind of new musical in that way. And uh, you're quite right. I I would call it a biography too. I think there probably is. There may be such a thing as a jukebox musical. I, I, I always associate that with the idea that you make up a storyline, and you know you've got existing songs and you make up a you know story, uh, which has been going on forever. I mean, people have been doing this you know uh, for for a very long time. And by the way, even with so-called new musicals, with you know, I, I can tell you for, with great certainty that most new, new musicals involve with new compositions songs that have come from the trunk. Songs that have been rejected for other shows, songs that have never been recorded by the composer. So, you know, you're always doing a little bit of that. I think there's always a, a little bit of a borrow and steal on all of these shows. Um, you know, I, I think you have to have a pretty strong idea. I mean, Marshall Brickman says something very smart about Jersey Boys. He says if it was about four physicists, there wouldn't be a score. No, they wouldn't sing. There wouldn't be any songs. So it happened to be about a band. And that gave us a great excuse. And it's actually fairly simple the way it operates as a show. And I, I mean, it seems to be still pretty effective after 10 years. Um, the songs in the first act, when they're, they're, they're basically, you know, you could, I suppose I'll almost describe them as hoodlums. They're certainly juvenile delinquents. And they, you know, I think, uh, two of them had spent 16 years of time in the in reform school in the penitentiary, a total of 16, before they took off. So you have these really innocent songs, and meanwhile they're kind of t dealing with the, the mafia. There's a juxtaposition there that's really delicious. As the band gets more experienced, more successful, more jaded, the songs start to advance the, the piece in a kind of thematic fashion. So you get into songs like Beggin' and, and Stay and Let's Hang On. All of, and all of the songs from really the end of the second act to the end of the show have some kind of thematic relationship with the storyline. So uh, I think you have to, if you're dealing with anything that's pre-existing, uh, if, if you're actually inventing something, you know, a, a biography or some other story, then you have to have a way into that experience that's going to be meaningful to an audience. And I don't know, I don't know often if I've done it. I guess I did it on Yoshimi, which was a completely different experience because I just listened to a bunch of music by the Flaming Lips and based on an incident in their lives, I got this notion, you know, listening to the songs uh, and uh, they were kind enough to let me kind of develop that very, very different experience from, from uh, uh, Jersey Boys. Tommy, of course, was conceived as a story, even though it's, 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 uh, uh, it's more of a, a concept album in many ways. There is the uh, story implied there. So the, I already had a lot of you know, architecture to work with uh, with that one. I think any time you're working with a classic musical, you're working with something that that's you know somebody's already done that work for you, uh, but you uh, you can't uh, when you're doing a classic. You obviously have to 
you know, pay attention to the, the, uh, the, the, the original intentions. And uh, so, I know, I find all of these, you know, experiences different. The one thing I wouldn't want to do is, you know, I, I try not to repeat. You know, I try to, end, I mean, it's a dilettante's paradise being a director, right? Because you can sort of enter a new solar system, you know, every time, up, you know, you come out of the box. And it's great to take advantage of that. Um, I'm not sure I would be all that good at trying to repeat something anyway. I, I you know, I think I would, uh, I, I don't think I'd have the, the gumption to, you know, it's, it's hard work. And I think part of it, the, the thing that makes it a privilege and exciting is, of course, is it, it's an adventure. You've been an artistic director as well as two of these behemoths, regional theaters from Stratford and La Jolla. Do uh, you enjoy heading up these giant institutions and being from the other artistic director I've talked to? It's not just about, oh, I pick some plays, I direct some plays when I want to. You become really a producer of these theaters in a way, even though you have managing directors. Sure. What's that experience like? I have enjoyed it tremendously. I, I would say that La Jolla uh, Playhouse, which, you know, this is complete uh, institutional egotism, but I, I do think it is one of the the great, you know, theaters in, in North America. It was, uh, you know, just a, a, a fantastic opportunity to be there from the get-go. You know, there was really no organization when I started that that we'd never... They hadn't produced a season for 20 years, and that had been summer stock. So that was a fantastic uh, thing to go through as a, as a young director. I was only 30 uh, when I went there. Uh, and I really considered that my greatest, my, my role in launching that theater. There were many others involved, of course, and many other directors. But my role in launching that as an artistic director, it probably is my like, greatest accomplishment. And that, that's the accomplishment I'm, 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 you know, perhaps most proud of. Um, you know, I think it's a whole spectrum of, of experiences. You know, I think you have to have a sense of duty to run a theater. I think if you're doing it for opportunity, for your own uh, opportunity, you probably figure out pretty quickly that there might be better ways to fulfill yourself. Um, you know, often you become as director, as artistic director, you have to, you always have to be responsible for what's going on with the institution. And, um, you know, when you're a freelancer and you're sort of a guest at a theater, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, the bottom line or, but when you're running a theater, the, you know, the audience, they become your family in a sense and the donors and the staff. And so you have to be worried about people's health care and, uh, or you should be doing it. And so, uh, I, I think you have to look at it as if you're doing your duty and, and you're supporting others. You know, you're not just doing it so that you can get to direct that, you know, you know, revenge tragedy you've always wanted to do. Um, What's great about it is you get to support other people. And I think the, the, the people that brought me to La Jolla wanted to help me fulfill my dreams as an artist. And so it was very easy for me to translate that into fulfilling other people's dreams. So when directors came to me, I wanted to do my best to, you know, uh, fulfill their dreams. And... Um, so I, I, I didn't just choose plays off of a menu and, and pick hirelings to come in to do them. If you're going to direct a play, you, you need to have some vision. You have to have a reason to do it. Um, and so it, it makes much more sense to ask directors what they want to do. And so I did spend a lot of time trying to... Um, encourage people to come up with ideas and and then to support them when they were executing those ideas uh, it, it was great I really enjoyed it uh, I'm I'm very happy though to wake up in the morning and for the most part get to concentrate on my own projects and uh, it 
you know, because I'm so used to the other things, it comes to me that feels a little selfish. Like, I feel like I should be, you know, going off to talk to the Rotarians or doing the various things that you do running a theater. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, I really enjoy being, you know, my, 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 my beautiful wife is a, an artist and a, a, a sculptor. And so she has a studio that's close to where I work. And I, I, I love that, not having to go off and, and uh, you know, make sure whatever, that the telemarketing people are being well taken care of or whatever it happens to be. Uh, on the other hand, I don't uh, resent or regret a single minute of the time I spent running the theater. It was just fantastic. One of the things that I will also say I think is one of your greatest accomplishments is at La Jolla, I really credit with you as helping to create the structure of the bridge from the regional theater to Broadway, La Jolla has pumped out so many shows, many of them directed by you, um, that have gotten here and developed this idea of the enhancement model of mm -hmm. producers going to regionals. Uh, how did that begin for you there, and how important is that to Broadway today, do you think? You know, I think it's important, and I think it can be dangerous uh, and I, I'll tell you why, in, in, uh, uh, but I'll answer the question first. You know, in the early 80s, we started the plays, and it was unusual to give birth to a new arts institution. I mean, this, again, was something that was coming back to life, but we'd been dormant for so long. It was a clean sheet project, as they would say, in the airline industry. It was a brand new airplane. And... Um, you know, it was a time when I think there was a feeling that uh, there, there was a lot of talk in those days about an artistic deficit, and there was a sense that Broadway had become very expensive and that there were a lot of, um, you know, th th theatrical producers and entrepreneurs that were waiting for product, you know, would be the term at the time. And then the re resonant theaters were often waiting for Broadway hits from two years ago. They're waiting for the rights to become available so that they could you know, put together a season of plays. So there was a sense that everybody was kind of waiting for everybody else. And um, I think with the Playhouse, while we had no, we had a little bit of a financial, uh, you know, member and a legacy that had been left us, not, not an awful lot, but a little bit, I think we had, uh, uh, we had this sort of ability to, to uh, we had no habits, I think is one way to, put it you know we had no habits we hadn't developed any institutional habits and that can be a great thing when you're starting something up so I think we were able to follow our impulses to do work we really believed in <clears throat> and um, it became very clear that if you were going to do you know work particularly with musicals that the resources of a not-for-profit theater were kind of inadequate and so because I was working with people like Rocco, who was one of the first uh, uh, producers to, to support work that way, um, I, I felt comfortable uh, doing the not-for-profit thing and inviting people that had rights to commercial shows to work with us to develop, develop the, uh, the, these, uh, these pieces. Uh, the thing is, we had very strict rules about um, responsibility. You know, when we produced a show, we called the shots in terms of what happened at our theater, you know, the, the artistic decisions that were made. We didn't expect to call the shots once the show moved on and somebody, if someone else had the first class rights, they had to then call the shots. So you have to have a certain amount of trust going into um, a situation like that because uh, needless to say, people are going to have strong opinions, and uh, I think we managed to do that very successfully. I, I can remember one or two occasions during the time I was there when it was uncomfortable, when the people thought of it as just an, an out-of-town tryout, uh, And but I can only honestly think of one or two times. I think the downside for the not-for-profit uh, organizations is that you don't want to become addicted to that kind of funding. Uh, now, anyone who's run a theater will tell you that 
people that work in for-profit are nece not necessarily more opinionated than people that come from other kinds of funding. You know, people from foundations can have awfully strong opinions, and they can be telling you what you should be doing to the National Endowment and down with the arts has been known to do that to say well this is the kind of work we're going to find so uh, everybody's got some sort of an agenda I think it's really important for all theaters to make their own decisions and even if that million dollar enhancement or in this day and age it's more like two and three million dollars if the, even if that looks really juicy to you you know be aware because uh you know, integrity is not something you can just have Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you have artistic integrity, it's got to be a full-time thing. So if you're taking funding from anyone, be sure that they understand that you're actually making the artistic decisions. That's fantastic advice coming from, uh, from you to all these regional theaters and for me to hear, because I've spoken to so many of these regional theaters, and I'm taking calls from people saying, Hey, Ken, do you have anything that you can do? <laughs> bring to us that you would enhance because they are looking to, to fill that void budgetarily rather than artistically. And I have great sympathy for that. I mean, the, the whole co-production thing is can be really difficult, and you end up feeling like a car salesman, and I'm sure not to disparage car salesmen, but, you know, you feel like you're calling up and saying, you know, I got a four character, you know, what do you, I could send you the four character in March, could you give me the... And, you know, suddenly you're not really making you know, decisions for, you know, the right reasons. And uh, it's and it's really hard. I mean, many of the resident theaters, they have small uh, auditoriums. You know, they don't generate an awful lot of so-called earned income, although the other, the contributed stuff is earned too, believe me. Uh, so, you know, it is a, a, a struggle. And I guess the most important thing is to, for all of us to try to be involved in one way or another philanthropically and to really, you know, put back. The thing I love about the partnership with, you know, a Rocco Landisman is or, or, is a Michael David. When you have a success, that creates a whole new income stream for the not-for-profit theater. And that money, in turn, creates more plays, more musicals, you know, more new work, puts more artists to work. And becomes, you know, we hear a perfect circle when that happens. You know, you're you're getting, and this is what, of course, Joe Papp did so brilliantly. Uh, he got uh, uh, Lou Esther Mertz to contribute all of the underwriting for a chorus line, and a chorus line created an entire theater scene. Uh, and uh, you know, I I had the privilege of in, enjoying. Uh, uh, productions that were based on the profits from a chorus line and I thank you know, Michael Bennett and Joseph Papp and Louis de Mertz and everybody that contributed so that, that it can be a really good thing it's dangerous though it, it can be dangerous those relationships can be perilous and you need to you need to have very clear rules about how it works um, and sometimes the opposite works you know you produce a show you're very proud of it you go to Broadway, I've had this happen too. You go to Broadway and, and, and the commercial producer's taken over. Maybe it's even a director that's a friend of yours that's been, and you look at the show and go, what are you doing? What have you done? But you, you don't really have the right to say, you know what, you can't do that because you entered into that relationship. So once they've taken it over, so you have to be care be careful. You, you don't want to sleep with just anybody. <laughs> be safe. Be safe. Practice safe there enhancing. Go, safe, safe enhancement. <laughs> uh, you uh, talked about your love of classic plays, but you also do musicals and new and revivals. Is there a project you have not done, a play or a musical, uh, that you've not done that you would drop everything for? Someone came to you and said, I want you to direct this on Broadway. Well, I have a certain gargantuan thing I would love to do. I would love to do Othello. I, I've become, uh, not to name drop, but I've become friends with, uh, good friends with, with uh, Christopher Plummer. And I happen to think he's the, you know, perhaps the great classical actor of our time. He's certainly one of them. And uh, in, in North America, I would say he's without question a great classical actor. And I got to see him with James Earl Jones do Othello years ago, um, which uh, 
ran a friend and uh, Barry Weisler produced, and uh, it was just you know, they were, it was an astonishingly good piece of work, and and Mr. Plummer was transcendent, uh, and so I would love now that that's far enough in the past, and I don't think he'd want to play it again. So I'd love to tackle that. Um, I I the thing I would really love to do, I would love to do at some point in my life if I get the chance to do Richard the Second through Henry the Fifth, which of course includes the two parts of Henry the Fourth in the middle, the great tetralogy. Uh, we don't get to see it done very often. Uh, certainly, the great tragedies are, uh, you know, the pieces that you really, you know, grow up, you know, worshiping. Uh, you know, Hamlet, Lear, uh, you know, Othello, Macbeth. These are without question, you know, the the, the greatest plays. And you think about Shakespeare with other artists, you know, you get the sculpture and painting and so on. It's 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 you know, if you take the ten greatest creations, you're generally going to have nine or ten artists with 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 plays. I think you've got the ten greatest plays, and probably seven of them are by Shakespeare. But the one that I think we don't get to see as much is this huge historical mural, you know, the, this great tetralogy that he wrote, uh, you know, right at toward the end of the, the, uh, the 1590s when he was a young dramatist. And I think that is just, uh, a, you know, a, a work of genius that is beyond human pro- comprehension. And I would love, I, I would find it very daunting and humbling to tackle it, but... With the right company, I'd love to do that, and I would even, you know, the couple of directors, I, I'm, I'm sure that that you know, uh, I would enjoy doing that with if it, if it became too much. You know, maybe you divide the plays up and in uh, in some way. So that that would uh, definitely be a dream. I'd also love to do uh, a film of Shakespeare. I mean, I I, uh, I did an adaptation some years ago of. Uh, Actually, a, a writer named Chip Hand, more accurately, did a, an adaptation, and I, I worked on this uh, of, of Romeo and Juliet. And the nice thing about being a director is, um, you know, maybe you can only play Romeo until you're 34 or 35, but you can direct it until you're 90 or beyond, I suppose. So um, that that's I'd still like to do that, too. <laughs> that's so true, and a reason for so many people out there, if your acting career isn't going the way you want it to, but think about directing. That's right, or or switch to Macbeth and then Lear. You know, that's that's what you have to do. So. And I was also thinking about those Henrys and all those histories, like the original Game of Thrones, that that Shakespearean series. There. Uh, okay, last question, um, which is uh, I'm calling my genie question. Now. Okay. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes and knocks on your door and says, right. "As you've done such a fantastic job of such a diverse, amazing uh, selection of material from." the classics, to Jersey Boys, to the work that you've done in the regional theaters at building these institutions. Uh, I want to grant you one wish, uh, a reward for all your hard work and dedication to the American and Canadian theater. Oh, my God. The one wish uh, is this. I want you to think about what drives you so crazy about Broadway. Gets you angry, gets you mad, keeps you up at night. Oh, if only this were different. What's the thing you would ask this genie to change with this one wish? I I would wish that it was less expensive. And uh, I think great work is being done. Uh, I, I I think you know this has been a I think a most uh, encouraging time. I think Janine Tesori is a wonderful composer. I think Hamilton's very exciting. I think there's some really good. Uh, plays uh, 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 going on. Um, I think it's become so expensive that there is uh, a tendency to want to go to stars, to people that can, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a, attract uh, ticket buyers at an outrageous level, so that you know you can you can kind of uh, get the investors' money back. And I don't know what the solution is to that ultimately, because it's not like uh, uh, the working actor is becoming wealthy working on Broadway, as as we know. Uh, stars make can make very good money, but the the chorus uh, woman who's who's you know doing eight shows a week and 
understudy rehearsals and the whole deal, you know, they're making perhaps a living, but not a, a great living. So I, I'd love to see that. And if the genie would really sit down and talk to me, I would say to the mayor's office that they could do things that would really help. We, we kick and scrape to get rehearsal space. The commercial theater brings in an, a, an astonishing amount of money to the city in the billions. And it would be really nice if there was some attention paid to that. A, a beautiful place to, to work, a, a nice rehearsal facility, maybe that was affordable for, for uh, producers and uh, perhaps uh, not-for-profit groups too. I mean, there are a lot of things I think one could do to uh, uh, improve uh, the whole Broadway culture that would affect the art and that might ultimately uh, affect the ticket prices. I think, you know, I think there's lots of great things to do. I think groups coming together and saying, I, we're going to pay for tickets for students. And, you know, we, we guarantee that students can get, you know, and for a lot of students, $10 is an enormous amount. But, you know, I think that kind of work uh, really needs to be done so that it doesn't become elitist, so that, the, 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 you know, Broadway remains oven for the people. Well, I'm certainly not a genie, but I'm very thankful that you sat down to talk to me today. Um, uh, and I'm sure everyone out there is just as thankful. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks to all of you out there for listening. We've got some great guests coming up, so don't forget to subscribe. You don't want to miss them. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. I'm gonna be a producer.